Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. Did you ever drive down the road in your vehicle and all of a sudden this film music pops in your head and you think, where did I hear that? What movie was it? Well, if you ever have that experience, you might want to talk to my guest today, uh, Professor Norm Wergler, music professor at the college. He teaches a course on music and film. And we're going to talk about that. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. We all experience that, don't we? Yeah, every time. Uh, yes. Talk about how film music is, say, different from regular, comp regular composing, uh, rock and roll, country music. Mm -hmm. Is it a special type of music? Well, yes and no. Uh, basically, film music is only different from concert hall music, you know, what we would call classical music, in that a classical composer is writing, for composing for movements of a given work, whereas a, cla a, theater, a film composer is writing for cues. And some of them can be very long, some of them can be very short. In the early days, uh, mostly they were just trying to capture what was the motion on, the, sti on the, the screen, you know. And I guess the other thing is that a lot of people don't realize that film music is really post-production. After the movie has been oh, edited sure. down to within what they call the rough cut, the maybe 15 minutes, of 15 minutes longer than what you're going to see in the theater, that's when the composer comes in and starts looking at the film and starting to write the music. Mm -hmm. Now, some composers will work w in tandem with the director, and so they're talking back and forth and so forth. But uh, really, it, it's when they get to the spotting session where they look at the film and say, okay, the music starts here, ends here, and what's happen this is, you're going to capture what's happening there. That spotting mm -hmm. session, that's the, the director and the editor, the music editor, and uh, the com mm -hmm. composer, of course. There is a, uh, a list of 100 of the greatest movies ever made, mm -hmm. according to critics. Uh, is there a list of the 100 greatest musical scores for films? There are probably 15 or 20 of them out 15. there, to be honest with you. Everybody has and, their and what opinion. Are, what are the top ones? But the top ones almost always come back to Gone with the Wind. Uh, and who wrote that? Max Steiner, uh, probably the grandfather of film music, if you will. Uh, uh, Bernard Herrmann's name comes up quite frankly for Psycho, uh, Citizen Kane. Uh, Which is Vertigo. the number one movie, Citizen Kane Yeah, is. it has been. It, 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 a lot of people point to that as the perfect film. Right. Uh, and it's fun to study that film, by the way. We do spend a lot of time in my class with that one for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and uh, uh, Maurice Jarre, or Maurice Jerry's name comes up for Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Dr. Zhivago, those, those epic films. Right. You know? And some John Ford movies... Uh, the, the composer for a lot of those was a guy by the name of, uh, it's going to go away from you for a moment, but it'll come back. Uh, I'll, I'll come back as we're talking, but sure. he was famous for writing cowboy type music for John Ford's movies. And when you say cowboy music, those of us who are our age know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, go back to Psycho, which mm -hmm. to me, that's a film where the music really is important to it. Absolutely. Try to imagine the, the, the famous uh, the shower scene without that music. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you mentioned before that in your class you all have actually done things, uh, they're mm -hmm. action films, taking mm -hmm. the music away, right. uh, and uh, how did that work out? Oh, it's, it's, very, it's very telling. The students begin, wow, I never realized that. And oftentimes composers will tell you, I wrote this music, but I don't know if anybody remembers hearing it when they leave the theater because it's such an integral, if they've, 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 if they've done a good job, it's such an integral part of the film. Right. If we could go back to Psycho for a moment, sure. it was a lot of the tr people who are into Trivial Pursuit will know this, but Hitchcock didn't want music for that scene. He and Bernard Herrmann argued about that. So Herrmann went ahead and composed the score and said, what do you think, Hitch? And he said, well, it's perfect. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, he said, but you told me, well, I was wrong. <laughs> That's, yeah. It's fascinating. A and, of course, North by Northwest, mm -hmm. you've also got the music when they're running around on the Mount Rushmore. That, that, that yeah. It, it, it really adds. And, and, you know, Bernard Herrmann only composed music for one comedy, The Trouble with Harry, which is about finding a dead body in the hills of Connecticut. <laughs> Absolutely. He <laughs> wrote that. That's his com That's the only comedy, I think, to my knowledge, it's the only com comedy he ever composed. I remember that. And even uh, that music's kind of dark. <laughs> it is. It is. I remember that movie. Yeah. In fact, I saw it on the old uh, the Turner 
classic movie yeah, channel. Shirley MacLaine's first film. It yes, I, I can believe she channeled it. people. Very, very, very young. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Another film genre, if that the term is genre, was what we called space music, mm -hmm. uh, and it was that that weird stuff. Yeah. And there was a special instrument that they made that music with. Yeah, the theremin. What is that? The theremin. It's a. Uh, it's not hard to explain. It's really a cabinet with, with uh, vacuum tubes in it and a metal bar that comes down on the side and it creates a, a, an electric or magnetic field and you pass your hands through it and the closer you come to the metal bar, the louder the music gets and the higher your hand goes up, the higher the, mitch, the, mitch, the mitch pitch goes. And it's got this little, little bar on the side that helps control the volume. So it's, it's a very interesting instrument. It's the only instrument I know that you, don't, you can play without ever touching it after you've turned it on. Right, right, it, was, right. it was invented by a guy by the name of Leon Theremin, a Russian uh, electronics engineer uh, who devised it. And uh, uh, it was about 1912, 1913, somewhere around there. Did he, wh what did he make it for? Was it for music? He, it, was gonna be a, it was gonna be a classical instrument, he thought. And Hollywood got a hold of it and kind of spoiled that for him because it's sort of got this uh, attachment now of horror films. And right, right. Sci-fi sci films. I remember the yeah. day the earth stood mm -hmm. still. I mean, oh, that, that's just perfect. Perfectly. In that. For that. It, it is. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, and on the other hand. Another Bernard Hermann film, by the way. Ah, ah. <laughs> and on the other hand, you think of a banjo. That, you, that's always a happy type thing. Or, or, or in the case of Deliverance, which yeah. is kind of. Or associated with, with folk music and bluegrass type music, yeah. 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 And again, you talk about, we were talking about composers before we started the program. Uh, composers have to be good composers that are going to compose for film have to have a knowledge of all those different styles. They have to be flexible. And so uh, if you, you ask Bernard Hermann to, to compose music for Deliverance, I don't think he could do that. He, he was very much into the dark side of life in terms of drama. He wasn't into the, the folksy kind of music. He wouldn't be that familiar with a banjo, say. Uh, so you, would look for, you wouldn't look for him to compose for that particular um, uh, Genre, well, are there particular instruments that are for scaring people, for whimsy, for different things? Uh, what, what, what made me think of that mm -hmm. is, is the theme from the Pink Panther. There's that mm -hmm. saxophone playing, yeah. that funny saxophone. Well, that's that jazz, that jazz flavor that Mancini ha always had. You right. Know? And sure, so he, would, he, would, he was trying to capture that kind of flavor, that kind of, uh, well, jazz is so improvisational, so we've got this incredible detective who Im improvises all the way through the film. Right, you know, right. He's always into trouble, so yeah, jazz yeah. is perfect for that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, again, going, let's just talk about a few of the greatest film composers, because we go to the movie, and, mm -hmm. and who we, in the credits, obviously the composer's there, mm -hmm. but we look at the stars. We don't know the credits, we know who they are. Mm -hmm. But you, you never, the, the, the guy who writes the music, you just never hear that much about them. So who mm -hmm. are the top four or five? Well, and what did they do? If we start with the early days of film, sound in film, we'd have to talk about Max Steiner, did the music for Casablanca, uh, Gone with the Wind. You'd have to talk about uh, Franz Waxman, who actually was, actually did a lot of orchestrations for uh, Waxman, uh, or for uh, Steiner. But Franz uh, did the uh, uh, music for Bride of Frankenstein, which is probably one of the more important musical scores for a horror film by, uh, by uh, Franz Waxman. Then we'd have to talk about, uh, working our way through, Korngold, who did all those movies with, with Errol Flynn, Adventures of Robin Hood, Captain Blood, the Seahawk, all those swashbuckling right. films. And there's a great story behind that too, but we won't have time for it today. And then, we, of course, we, we make our way to John Williams, who is, by most people's standards, credited with really the rebirth of the symphonic film score by writing the music for Star Wars. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then from there, then with, along with him, we've got to talk about Hans Zimmer, who's done action. He's, he's, here's a guy who wrote action film, and then he did the music for Driving Miss Daisy. Wow. It's just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and, and Danny Elfman's got it, making a real good name for himself, David Julian. But I, uh, right now, most people know John Williams from all those big hits with Lucas and Spielberg. Right. And uh, those are the big, John Powell for all of the, uh, the, first three epi the first three movies of uh, the Bourne Legacy and all that kind of stuff. Right. The Bourne Legacy, I, but before that, Bourne Legacy is James Newton Howard, who's, again, another fine composer. Randy Newman, 
who made a fortune about old, uh, what was he tall? He wrote, wrote the song, Short People Got Yes, no exactly, re sure. That's how he got started, but he wrote the music for um, The Natural. Didn't the, know the, that. One of the great baseball movies oh, of is. all time. It is. But that music is so fantastic. Yeah. And then there are composers who are classical composers who have written for film. Aaron Copland, the dean of American composers, yes. wrote the music for uh, Our Town and more importantly for the, well, the first production of, uh, of Mice and Men with Burgess Meredith and Lon Chaney Jr. And wow. he composed that music. It's haunting music. It's it beautiful is. music. It is. Yeah. And you also think of, I think of a movie, uh, The Sting, mm -hmm. when they use Scott Joplin's music mm -hmm. as the score. So that's, that actually was not film music, it, it's no. just his, no. so you see that too, yeah. don't you? And that, yeah, that's really, in, in, in the film parlance, that's called um, tracking, where they take pre-existing music that's already been recorded and work it into the film. Sometimes that grows out of uh, what we call a temporary track, where a, a director and a producer will put a bunch of pieces together to preview it for potential investors or what have you. And sometimes that temporary music becomes part of the film. A really good example of that is 2001 A Space Odyssey, Kubrick's film. He put together all this, this classical music by uh, Richard Strauss and, and Johann Strauss and all that, and used that as a temporary track. And yeah. then he hired Alex North to write the score. And the, 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 you know, the, the story goes that Alex North went to the premiere to see this film with his friends to, watch, to hear his music and only discovered that they used the temp track instead. Mm. And no one told him. Can you imagine that? But you know, Norm, what's funny about that is when you hear that class, mm. you think, that's 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't, but that's <laughs> no, what you think it was it also Sprach Zarathustra, yeah. A absolutely, yeah. And, and it's like, well, you, you know, and, and uh, well, it, we had talked earlier before the program, uh, Bridge on the River Kwai, mm -hmm. the, when the British soldiers come, prisoners come whistling, mm -hmm. And uh, we were in England years ago. My wife and I bought a CD, and we got home, popped it in the car, and I said, that's Bridge on the River Kwai. But, but the label actually said Colonel Bogey's March. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a British marching song right. that they worked into films like right. that. So they do that mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, and it's important for a composer to be familiar with all that, the, the composer, the music supervisor, the music editor, because it's, oftentimes it's a matter of picking the right tune for the right scene or to establish uh, the right time. I mean, I think of American Graffiti where uh, they used the rock and roll, old time oh, rock period. and roll, all the right. way through there. Yeah. And Quentin Tarantino is, is excellent at taking contemporary music, rock, you know, popular music, and finding a way to make it tell his story. I, I think of, of, of Pulp Fiction, for example, mm. does a g great way of telling the story and, and using uh, pre recorded music. And that's where, you know, the composer may not even be involved in that. That's where they have the, the music supervisor whose job is. To, uh, to clear all the licenses and the copyright to use that music. So mm -hmm. you know, I was telling my students the other day, if, if, if you're not interested in composing music, you might want to get a little bit of law behind you, a little law degree, and become a music supervisor somewhere for, for uh, music studios. To be careful you don't right. violate don't copyright. Right, the B, you know, BMI and ASCAP are going to keep an eye on you. Right, <laughs> right, right. Um, I think of other movies in which uh, the, the the music it, it's it's choral music. I think mm -hmm. of Glory, that tremendous chorus yeah, yeah. in that. So they also work that in there too. Sometimes. Absolutely, and that's also been a Hollywood tradition uh, since the early days of sound. Using a chorus, just humming or just vocalizing, no words. It really creates a different atmosphere, kind of an ethereal quality. Danny Elfman loves to do that. When you listen to any of his any of his films. Uh, with Tim Burton, you're going to hear the, the background, ha, ah, ah, ooing and aahing and so forth. And mm -hmm. the very important aspect, even the class classical composers were very much aware of that. Uh, Ravel's mm -hmm. Daphnis and Cloy makes a great deal of use of, it makes the sound of the wind by using the voices. Well, I think of Ravel, uh, Bolero, uh, in uh, yeah. um, Ten. Ten. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's the thing you think of ten. <laughs> there, there she is. Exactly. And you think of this, you you say do. It, yeah. It's so funny. And poor poor Ravel is thinking, that's me. That's but, me. Yeah. <laughs> and I, quite no. frankly, that wasn't one of his favorite pieces, too. Yeah. He said, I but, hate but that piece. You think of Bo Derek. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Can, I've got a mental image of that. I really do. Yeah. Just jogging in slow motion. Oh, yeah. wow. And it's just, it's incredible about yeah. how, uh, you know, I, it's, do you find that your students discover they actually do have an appreciation for classical music because kids today, yeah. you know, rock and roll and all that, and then you, you, you hit them with some of this classical stuff and Absolutely. do they actually like it? Absolutely. If truth be told, that's one of my ulterior motives with ah, this class. Is sneak it in I can on. teach music appreciation through a venue that they're very familiar with, that is film. 
Right. And we, they sort of rediscover Bach, Beethoven. Bach used in uh, the movie Rollerball with James Caan back in 75, 76. The, the very opening, we start with the Toccata and Fugue in D minor, which is usually associated with horror films. Da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. Oh, right, exactly. Yeah. Da -da -da. Yeah. And out comes the Rollerball team. You know. Oh, oh, it's, it, 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 you're it, absolutely right. Yeah, and they use a, some Bach inventions as they go through there as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, just uh, briefly uh, outline your course. Uh, what mm -hmm. exactly? Uh, I would think this would be a great course yeah. for well, someone who just from the community just wanted to come and take an interesting yeah, course. Sure. I, I try to stress the importance of what music does, how subliminally it, they can manipulate us to feel or not to feel. Uh, and the choice of instruments and so forth, the orchestration. Um, I do an experiment with them. I show the opening a uh, few minutes of, of Forrest Gump with a beautiful little piano uh, solo that starts off as The Feathers Floating by Alan Silvestri. And then I'll substitute a, uh, uh, a different, different opening title. I used uh, something from uh, uh, Ghostbusters. And it worked. And, and, and just to show them that just by changing the, without telling them anything else, just by changing the music, it, it changed their expectations of what that film was going to be like. We've got this beautiful establishing shot of the city, the feather floating, you know, randomly through the air, which is the metaphor for, of course, Forrest Gump going through life. And then this, this music creates this wonderful childlike expectation of, of this. And then we go to Forrest Gump or something. For, oh, I, I played... Uh, 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 Bernard Herrmann's score from uh, uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Gord's mm. music, boom, 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 all those low, uh, mm. and, and it just changes everything. And then I do it for comedy too. I show the scene from Jaws where the, 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 the shark goes by the boat and, and Roy, Roy says, we're going to need a bigger boat, that sort of thing. And then I substituted music from our gang comedies and all of a sudden the kids were howling. You know, you know that you mentioned Jaws. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You remember a movie called uh, Caddyshack? Yeah. And there's a scene in there in the pool where there's this floating baby Ruth, which of course looks like you know what. Yeah. And they do this scene from Jaws, the movie from, the music from Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> it just cracked them up. The, dun, 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 dun. It's a baby Ruth. Just, just by putting it in a Absolutely, different context. Absolutely, it yeah. just, it, it's a terrific way to use serious music in a very funny sure. way. And that's one of those scores that uh, after Jaws, that score, People would not go near the water. And you know that score, you, you, could hear you, that you also hear it. Uh, I've heard high school bands play it for mm -hmm. football games. Yeah. It's just in a, in, a, in a tense moment in the game, they play that. It's just, uh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, also, of course, part of film music would have to be songs that yeah. were popularized. What yeah. are some of the top songs that movies have made famous? I think you have hundreds to of them. I think you'd have to go to High Noon. Oh, don't forsake me. Oh, my darling. Absolutely. It became just. Now, was that written for that movie? Yeah. It was. Yeah. And it became a big hit. And after that, th this is, we're talking, that's what, 1950 something or other? Yeah. I'm trying to remember. It's in the 50s. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but the, all of a sudden, the studio said, okay, we need to have a hit song for every movie after this. Right. Okay. Exactly. So then all of a sudden we were getting a whole line of, of movies that came out with hit songs, and that was sort of putting the the halt, if you will, on the symphonic score. Sure. That's why when, when I mentioned before, John uh, Williams is credited with bringing back the symphonic score in '76. Right. Because there for a while we went through a period where we smaller so resources hit songs, pop tunes, trying to reach out and get those teens with disposable income that didn't exist before. Right, <laughs> right. So. Yeah, well, I was thinking, of course, Doris Day, K. Seurat. Seurat. That's another yeah, one. The Man Who Knew Too Much, yeah. The Absolutely, remake, yeah. It, just, it just goes on uh, and on when you, mm. when you think about that. And, and I, well, and I th go ahead. No, I was gonna say, it just speaks to a really important part of what film music should do. This idea of a, a light motif or a motive that you relate to. The, the composer is relying on our memory, if you look. Film, film and, and music are very much alike. They unfold linearly, all right? And so you get this, this tune that you remember. You say, where did I hear that tune? That's, that's the hook. Da, da, di, da, 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 di. Of course. You hear that tune, you know. and you're in the old south, you are, the yeah, antebellum absolutely. south. Exactly. And that tune, you're, you're seeing this big tree, the silhouette of, that's of right. Scarlett O'Hara yeah. looking up. And yeah. the composers know this. And so when that tune comes back, you're expecting to see her or she's going to be there. Yeah. Star Wars, da-da, da-da-da-da, there's Luke. Right. 
Right. <laughs> there's there's Darth Vader, you know. There is. And so all these themes keep intermingling, and and that's that all really gets to start with with uh, well, well actually with Wagner back in the 1850s, but with uh, uh, Max Steiner and his early films, his idea of using a motif, and then then he right. carries on and right. and we finally get to John Williams. I mean, you, you can't go to a movie anymore and not listen wow. to that theme. I'll spend the rest of my day doing this, but mm -hmm. now I have in my head the theme from The Great Escape oh. with Steve McQueen. <laughs> yeah. I can hear it now. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the Longest Day, that one's coming oh, on now. Gosh, yeah. Uh, uh, then there was that television program, Victory at Sea, that oh, yeah. tremendous. Now, who did that music? I don't know. I'll but it's that, that oh, it's that dun, 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 and the sea is swelling up. Yeah, you can just yeah. see it. It just, and all these, uh, wow, uh, when That's, you start thinking about that. No, I've got something to do this afternoon, too. Exactly. I'm going to look that one up. <laughs> on, uh, yeah, but on, on the way home to, to, uh, to Callaway County, yeah. you'll be popping right. these things. Yeah, because, you know, because the interesting thing is, especially in, uh, when we're talking about the war years, uh, a lot of composers and artists and photographers were were commissioned in the military to do just that. Exactly. I mean, uh, what's his name? Capra. Oh yeah, Frank was, Capra. Frank Capra yeah. did, made a lot of, of, of films, recruiting films, and uh, uh, to raise funds for uh, savings if bonds. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. I'm, I'm about to say, one of the producers or, mm -hmm. or directors actually w went, went to Midway Island and was there and filmed all that when the Japanese mm -hmm. attacked. It was, I don't know whether it was John Ford or it was Capra. I, I don't remember, but it was but it was on one of these, yeah. one of these Hollywood directors. Yeah, yeah. But you think of the in these war movies that had songs with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be home for Christmas. Was that a film? That um, I don't. Bing Crosby, of course, sang. I'll be home that. for Christmas. Yeah, I don't know if that was written for a film, uh, 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 for the for war films or for films during the war years. Right. Uh, but what comes to mind uh, is. Uh, I'll be seeing you. No, no, not I'll be seeing you. Wait a minute. We'll come again. Oh yeah. Don't know when. We're, don't. don't know yeah. Right. Where. Exactly. Yeah. F a film song, a song written during the war years that became really important in Doctor Strangelove, or how I stopped, to, how I learned to, to to stop worrying and uh, you start loving the, the bomb. bomb. Right. Yeah. And Gosh, I'd at the end, that. as as as, as uh, <laughs> Slim Pickens is riding, <laughs> the, atomic bomb riding the atomic out. bomb to right. the ground, and these explosions are going off, and we're yeah. hearing, we'll meet again. It's just, don't know where, yeah, don't and, know and where. that's the bizarre, yeah. I love yeah. that. When they but can, again, using music for going against what, yeah. what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. that's just. Uh, contrasting the action. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had talked earlier, mm -hmm. and the time is running out, I'm sorry, we'll have to do this again. Sure. Um, about maybe even developing a film studies program here. How are you doing? On well, that? we'd like to do what I what my dream is. It's sort of an introduction to film studies. Uh, in my research, most film studies, serious film studies, started by junior level and beyond. But what I thought we could do here is introduce students to just the variety of types of music that they need to be aware of in terms of if they want to go into film. Because uh, directors need to know some of this too. A lot of directors will rely on the knowledge of the composer, but a lot of directors also have well. Uh, Kubrick, for example, but uh, so to give an introduction to cinema, the history of cinema, cinema as art, as literature, uh, and Murray State has a program, Western Kentucky has a program, very good program, both of them, uh, and I think there's more of an interest to it, as especially in film music. I mean, anymore, when I was a kid growing up, you could buy the occasional film recording of the soundtrack. Oh, yeah. But now there are whole sections dedicated just to film music. Absolutely. Now. And we and have so that about speaks, 50. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. speaks to the importance of what it has done and how it's become yeah. uh, that important. And so th uh, my dream is that to get students in, in interested that are interested in it, look at it, see what it feels like, uh, present some career opportunities they may not have considered before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, when you look at a film, let's just go back, 1915. Uh, Birth of a Nation, originally called The Klansman. When D.W. Griffith made that film, there was so much research done right down to the buttons on the uniforms that they wore. I mean, it's an amazing film from that standpoint. The, the uniforms, the weapons they fired, everything. Horribly racist. The, well, absolutely. It was banned in many cities. Yeah. But, but it's important because of the detail that went into it, I think, and the story it's trying to tell. And so there's room in cinema for history majors, for psychology majors, for whatever. That's why I think Murray States is, is, is an interdisciplinary program. And I believe, I don't mm -hmm. know, I can't speak currently, but at one time they actually had a course 
the sort of informant called mm. Hollywood history. Yeah. And what's fascinating about a movie mm. is you can analyze the movie from a literary point of view. There is a in the English department, mm. of course, yeah. uh, uh, of that. But you can analyze a movie in different ways, mm. and certainly the music is part of it. And we had talked before about Patton, mm. which can be considered both a pro-war or an anti-war movie. Mm -hmm. And the film score for that is one of these epic, you know, mm -hmm. war-type movies. Yeah. It, it's it's uh, uh, it's amazing what a part of our popular culture there are. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I'm thinking of some more now. I've got to try to finish this up without <laughs> getting completely off off key on that but we also talked about about uh, certain instruments uh, that, that are uh, give me some examples of an instrument that is just perfect for creating the kind of mood that you're well we talked about deliverance the, of the banjo yeah. <coughs> the, uh, deliverance of the banjo to kill a mockingbird uh, begins with a piano solo just the one hand melodic piano solo and or it actually starts with humming and goes to the piano solo but that establishes Scout's character, who's going to tell us this story, this little girl. The instrument's perfect for it. The, the piano for Forrest Gump, because every young child starts a piano lesson at one time or another, or most of them do. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're looking at a film like uh, Magnificent Seven, for example, we've got this, this magnificent orchestral thing, but the pervading instrument all the way through, there's a guitar. Boom, chicka, chicka, boom, for cowboys, so, of Trying to capture that cowboy, western kind of right. motif. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, it, just, it just depends on, on right. the film, you see. Right. Well, and the, the composers have to be aware of all these things, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, going back to, to Psycho, that creepy eat, 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 how mm -hmm. did they do that? On the high strings, just tring, tring, tring. You know, the, on violins, violin. and the violins and their overtones, the of harmonics course. are real high, real screechy sounding. Of course. And it's, it's, of course, you know, uh, the Norman Bates is, is, is a t uh, taxidermist. He stuffs a lot of birds, so you get the birds screaming up here. Chee, chee, of chee, course. Chee, chee, right? Of course. Shooting right, away. Right, yeah, right. they attack. And Bernard uh, Hermann uses that again in uh, uh, the one with the, the birds. Oh, yes. Oh, that's yeah. terrifying. The, 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 oh, the, the, one of the, my yeah. favorite scenes in that is the children are in the school singing the song that keeps accumulating verses. Right. And as you start with da 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 uh, uh, that's the wrong song, but yeah. then we have a couple yeah. of birds landing. On, then on the, the kids, yeah. they start the right. next verse, right. and they get longer and more birds. Oh, it's an incredible <laughs> it uh, really imagery that yeah. it uses with yeah. the music. Yeah. Uh, in the few seconds we have left, how have a modern computer, how's modern computer music uh, affected this? Well, it's made it easier yeah. because the composer can hear everything he wants the minute he's got it on paper because he can program it into his, his synthesizer. Right. Uh, it's helped composers like Danny Elfman, Hans Zimmerman, who, neither of, who, of whom read music. So, but they have this incredible, as we were saying yeah. earlier, vocabulary of sounds yeah. in their head, so they can just pick and, yeah. and plug yeah. it in and plug it in. It's like yeah. the pipe organist, actually. Right. Pull right. out all the stops right. and hit exactly. that piston, and exactly. away you go. Exactly. And so, and it certainly helps in editing. Yeah. Gosh, it's yeah. changed a lot for the musician. We're out of time. We'll have to do this again. Sure. This is great, because I'm thinking of some more songs in my head, but I won't talk <laughs> about that now. So, thank you for joining us. I'm Barry Craig. My guest was Norm Wergler. We'll see you next time.